Every time we moved, I, I would try and find a martial art to train in. Hey there, everybody. Thanks for stopping by. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. It's episode 384, and today I'm joined by Coach Joe Saunders. My name is Jeremy Lesnick. I'm your host on the show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick, and martial arts is my life. You can find out all the projects that we're working on at whistlekick.com. And if you choose to buy something while you're over there, and I hope you do, helps keep the lights on, you can use the code PODCAST15 to save 15%. If you want everything related to this show, that's a separate website. That's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And that's where you'll find show notes, transcripts, photos, videos, links, and all of it available for free. We do this show twice a week, and we hope that you enjoy it. So please help us out a little bit, share the show, leave some comments, make a purchase, just something. Help us keep going. Today, I'm joined by fellow martial arts podcaster, Coach Joe Saunders. It was a great conversation, had a lot of fun. We talked a lot about reality-based martial arts and violence. It's a subject that's come up on the show a couple times before, and we've even exchanged some guests. I hope you enjoy listening as much as I enjoyed participating. So here we go. Coach Saunders, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much, Jeremy. I appreciate the invitation, and uh, thanks for having me. Absolutely. I appreciate you being on. You know, you have the distinction of being one of a few guests who also have your own podcast. So as I tell the audience this, they're expecting amazing, great things out of both of us. <laughs> well, don't expect too much because it is 5.30 a.m. at the moment where I'm recording <laughs> from. So uh, I'll, I'll try not to disappoint, but uh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see how we go. I've, I've only had one coffee, which is uh, probably about three less than I need, but we'll, we'll, oh. make, do. we'll make do. Oh, well. I appreciate you waking up early and yeah, I imagine, I always try to put myself in the place of the listeners and I imagine when they hear, oh, the guest also has a podcast. These guys are going to be pros. They're going to knock it out of the park. And it, you know, it would probably be, probably be similar as, you know, you have two black belts who have never trained together, people with lots of experience and they get together to, let's say, present a seminar. Mm. That might not go very well because they don't no. know each other. They don't know when when to work together, when to leave each other alone. And that's kind of, I mean, that's that's pretty similar to what we're doing here today, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. But uh, look, I'm more than happy to be the UK. You can be the Tory and we can, uh, you, you step and I'll follow. If I do my job well, it's going to come across the opposite way. So let's <laughs> let's, okay. let's dig into that and let's... You know, you're you're already throwing around Japanese terms, so that 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 tells us something about your <laughs> your uh, your training time. So, how did you get going? How did you find martial arts? Okay, so um, so uh, I'm from Australia. If uh, if my accent isn't giving it away, but um, I, I grew up um, with with brothers that were uh, much older than me, so um, yeah, I had a sort of a a blended family with um, both my my mother and father had previous marriages and. Uh, and kids from those previous marriages, and I was the the sole product of of their second marriage each. And uh, so I had uh, two brothers that were thirteen years and fifteen years older than me. So I grew up as the very much the baby of the family. I had sisters as well, but they're not not consequential to the story. <laughs> sorry, sorry, <laughs> sisters, if you're listening. Um, but both my brothers were um, were national champions in taekwondo. And uh, so from the age of well, basically from when I can remember. Uh, there was always a Bruce Lee movie on or a Jean-Claude Van Damme movie on TV. Uh, my brothers would be going to tournaments and coming back with medals. And because I was the kid brother, I would, uh, they'd come home and they'd put the medal around my neck. And I thought that was pretty cool. So pretty much from the time I was old enough, I'd pressured mum into to letting, me, uh, letting me go train. So I started Taekwondo, I think I started about four years of age, which um, uh, I think was about a year younger than they, they wanted to allow it. but. I guess because I was persistent, they, they end up giving in. Um, so I, I started off at my brother's Taekwondo club and uh, I don't really have a great deal of memories from that time because I was being so so young. But um, uh, over the next uh, decade or so, um, my family moved around quite a bit. So we, we moved cities uh, and towns on a regular basis every couple of years uh, just for work and whatever else. And uh, every time we moved, I, I would try and find 
a martial art to train in. And uh, I wasn't really picky. I didn't really know much about what I was doing. I just knew I enjoyed this thing where you wear the pajamas and you, you do the kicking and the punching. So um, I, I got an early exposure to a variety of different martial arts. So, yeah, so in some areas that we moved to, you know, we moved uh, predominantly in sort of larger rural areas. So there wasn't always a huge selection of what was available. And I just ended up wherever it was a, uh, was available and cheap probably <laughs> for the, the, the main guiding factor. I, I can now reflect on as a parent that uh, my parents probably just chose a, a, a sample of two or three that were affordable and said you can choose one of those ones. So uh, so I got, got to have a little bit of exposure to, to um, uh, I know I did a little bit of Shin Karate when I was, when I was younger. I did some, uh, some goju ru. Uh, I did some boxing. I did some kickboxing. There's some Zendo Kai, which is an Australian freestyle. Um, freestyle karate slash kickboxing sort of system. And uh, yeah, so as, as we moved around, I just sort of played with uh, different martial arts wherever we went and uh, which actually uh, reflecting on that now um, built a really good base for, for what would come next because I didn't get married to anyone's style and I didn't, uh, I didn't develop uh, rigid, um, I guess, uh, concepts of, of how things should be done. I was quite open to, to different approaches because every time I got a new sensei or a, a new master, I, I would learn a new way of doing something that I'd previously done. So I, I guess it, uh, it forced me to be open-minded from a young age, which is um, sometimes a, a battle I've found when I'm, when I'm training now, when I'm, when I'm training lifelong martial artists that have been doing something since they're four, it's very hard to, uh, to explain that might be, maybe there's a different way. So, um, so yeah, that, that was pretty much my, my early years and, uh, uh, I can, I can sort of give you the synopsis of, of what happens next, but, um, I, I took a couple of years off martial arts to play rugby, uh, in yeah, growing up in, uh, in Queensland and Australia, it's uh, playing rugby league is sort of a, a rite of passage. And, uh, I ended up, I ended up, uh, s- sustaining quite a bad, uh, Facial fracture. I, 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 I caught a running elbow to the face and broke my orbital bone and my septum and uh, a few other squishy bits in my face. And uh, I had to. I was told I, I couldn't um, couldn't play rugby league anymore and uh, awaiting surgery. Once I this is when I was fourteen, so I uh, I was told I had to have surgery when I was eighteen, but they wouldn't they wouldn't do the surgery until I finished growing. So I had to do something else. I couldn't, couldn't uh, sustain any more face impact. And uh, so I, at that point, I was just lifting weights in the, at a local community center, what we call a, a PCYC or a Police Citizens Youth Club. And uh, I just started lifting weights and I happened to come out of uh, maybe a year into this. I came out of the, the gym and I saw these guys throwing each other around on a gymnastics mat. And uh, I went over and asked them what they were doing because I was, a, I was a big pro wrestling fan and I recognized that these guys were suplexing each other. I thought, that looks pretty cool. What are these guys up to? And I went over and asked them. And as it turns out, it was uh, one of Australia's very, very, very few uh, amateur wrestling clubs, uh, Greco and Freestyle Wrestling Club. And uh, that, like, the, the sport is so tiny in Australia that it was a complete fluke that I even found these guys. And uh, yeah, as it turns out, the, uh, the coach there was a guy named Yuri Markov. Yuri was a former assistant coach of the USSR national team from the. Uh, the 80s and 90s and uh, he was you know, a tremendous coach and uh, one of the other guys that was wrestling with him was a, a then young man named uh, Dan Higgins who was one of Australia's top mixed martial arts fighters of the time and this is maybe 2001 so pre-MMA uh, boom but uh, he was fighting professionally in Japan and uh, we also had a guy there uh, a large guy named Aaron Stapleton who was a uh, multi-time national champion in greco Roman wrestling so I, I've stumbled across these guys to a quite high level and uh, I was a I think 15, 15 year old kid and uh, they kind of uh, took me in and, and let me train with them and, and that was my first exposure really to uh, to training hard because anyone who's ever wrestled will tell you that it's probably the most physically demanding <laughs> combat endeavor there is. I'm, I'm not aware of any lazy wrestlers and uh, especially with a Russian coach, I just got absolutely creamed for, for weeks on end uh, before I actually learned anything. I think they were just trying to make sure I was going to keep coming back before they bothered investing in me. And uh, yeah, that sort of led to a, uh, led to a uh, development where I, I 
for the first time in my martial arts journey, I was actually good at something. <laughs> I was a I was a fairly big kid, and uh, by the time I was fifteen, I was already six foot one, and uh, in these American terms, probably about two hundred and forty pounds. Good job so, making that conversion on the fly, by the way. Yeah, yeah, I do, <laughs> I do it regularly. <laughs> so, uh, so I was already a bit. I was always a big kid, and uh, wasn't overly flexible. Uh, but uh, so, so obviously, Taekwondo uh, doesn't usually translate well if you're. Uh, if you're big, a little bit slow and not very flexible. So, um, yeah, but when I, when I, but when I started wrestling, all of a sudden all my natural sort of, um, abilities kind of, uh, came to the fore and I was actually fairly good at it. And, uh, well, I won't go too far down the path cause I'm sure we'll get there, but, uh, but that actually led to, um, my first real love, uh, which was judo. And, uh, I fell into judo because I was, uh, I was training for, a big wrestling competition that was coming up, our national championships. And my coach went back to Russia for um, for a holiday and there was no wrestling training for four weeks or something. And at the uh, at the youth club that I was training at, there was there was a judo club. And I went along and watched what they were doing and I, I recognized so many of the techniques that I thought, hey, I might just hang out with these guys and you know, do a little bit of training and and uh, coach will be really happy when, I, when he comes back that I've, I've stayed active. And uh, I realized that it, judo was a much more popular sport in Australia than what wrestling was, which is saying something because judo is not very popular still. <laughs> it, was, it had a higher profile than wrestling. And, uh, and these guys actually had the opportunity to compete. Um, yeah, every two to four weeks, there was a new competition uh, that these guys could compete at. And being at that point 17 years old and um, having trained a lot, the idea of being able to compete and test myself was very very appealing and i decided to off my own and uh, my own initiative to, to sign up and do a judo competition and uh i ended up tearing my acl in my first sorry my second match <laughs> so <laughs> i lost my first match and then tore my acl in my second match and uh that uh that led to me having having to take um you know, 12 months off training to have a, have a knee surgery and rehab and and I had to tell my coach when he came back from Russia that uh, this big competition that he'd been grooming me for that I, I wasn't able to compete because I'd torn my knee doing judo. And he said, why did you do, why did you do judo? And I was like, uh, I was trying to hit, trying to keep you happy. <laughs> so as it turns out, I mean, uh, we'll get into the story. I won't go too long. But um, uh, in the 12 months that I was away from uh, from actual training, I just became obsessed with studying judo um, and the history of judo and the philosophies of Kano. And uh, I got really enamored with, um, with the art. Uh, and I think it, I think it uh, was the exact right blend for me of something I was good at being grappling and, and uh, the traditional martial arts influence that I'd grown up with. And uh, I think just blending those two together. And then I also liked the creativity that judo allowed, especially at the time. It was pre uh, a lot of rule changes, but uh, in wrestling, I always felt that uh, there was about five high percentage techniques, and and once you once you'd kind of got those techniques down, it became a battle of who was a better athlete. Uh, whereas with judo, at the time, I felt there was uh, you know there's twenty or thirty techniques that could all work, and it, and it allowed you a little bit more creativity with how you could apply those techniques and and different styles that made for more interesting uh, interesting matches and strategic battles. And uh, so I, yeah, I, I fell in love with judo at that point, and. Uh, that kind of led to the, to the next stage. So uh, well, I'll, I'll stop it there because that, that gets me <laughs> to about 18 years of age. So that's, that's, my, that's yeah. my youth. There's a lot there. There's a lot we can say. And, and of course, we can, we can say, you know, because rugby beat you up pretty bad. You ended up finding judo, which beat you up pretty bad. Oh, yeah. You yeah know, we can, we can start. Uh, we can say that. Um, I'm, 20, which, I'm 20 years older in my body than what I am in my age. So. <laughs> now, I'm... I'm I guess I'm curious, right? Because as you move move forward in time, talking about the different arts that you've trained in, and I am going to include wrestling in there, you know, whether or not we want to call wrestling a, a classic or a traditional martial art. Plenty of debate about that. We don't even have to have that debate because I don't know that it's relevant. But you talked about Taekwondo when you were four. Mm -hmm. You know, Taekwondo. You just kind of laid it out there. But as you talked about later arts you got a, a, a little more engaged you you know I, I could hear a little bit more emotion coming through in your voice 
And even sure. before you had talked about judo being this thing that you became passionate about, I could tell there was something different in judo for you. And and you know, not that that this is any kind of a video show, but it's no secret I, I keep notes as I'm talking to guests. Mm-hmm. And and when you first started talking, you know, I wrote down taekwondo and I crossed it out. And <laughs> within about ten seconds of you mentioning judo, I wrote down judo. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. What yeah, I, was I think, it about uh, judo? I mean, there are, there are plenty of people who have started in, in judo or in jujitsu or wrestling, and they kind of move around in between the three because of the similarities. But it just in the way you talked about wrestling versus judo, it seems like night and day for you. It's a, it was a very astute observation. Um, I, I think it was a combination of factors that so, some have to do with the art and some have to do with just the, the stage of my life I was at and uh, and uh, some other sort of intangibles about that uh, that club and uh, and uh, I guess the decision to train there. Um, I think definitely coming from uh, like when I started wrestling, that was a that was kind of the first time I had independently decided to study something on my own. So. Um, when I was growing up, martial arts just became part of my life. Where I was, you know, we'd move. Martial arts was a way of me finding new friends. I'd just go find a club. I'd train, and uh, I didn't really put much thought into it. It wasn't really a. You know, I was just a kid, and that was just quite, that was just something I did as a hobby. And uh, it wasn't really something I had great aspirations to to do forever. I don't think I ever really thought about whether I'm going to be a martial artist for my whole life, or whether I'm going to go to the Olympics or whatever. I never really had those those thoughts i just trained because it was fun and and sometimes you got to have a have an ice cream from mcdonald's on the way home afterwards um whereas when i had that break for a couple of years playing rugby league and then came back i I had to actually made a choice to to engage in in uh, this activity where i I could have been one of the the millions of people that we all meet that uh, oh yeah i did a little bit of martial arts as a kid and I did. I did. You know, six months of taekwondo, or I did six months of judo, or whatever. You know, you, you, everyone, we we have all these. We all have these people in our lives that feel they need to tell us about how they did a year of something when they were growing up. Uh, and that could have been me. And uh, but I but I made a choice to to come back. Um, and uh, wrestling started that because uh, it's yeah, as as a fairly unathletic kid. Uh, that was the first thing that kind of made me realize that I did have some ability to do something. It was just in a, in a new skill set. And then judo kind of really brought it home for me because I had, the, as I said before, I had the existing skill set, plus it had the traditional martial arts, um, uh, I guess, philosophies and the, uh, the, the culture and the etiquette and all that sort of stuff that, that was familiar to me and that I, that I loved from, uh, from martial arts growing up. And there's also some uh, some factors that, that really have nothing to do with the art. It's just to do with the fact that I was uh, I was 18 by the time I came back to judo after my knee reconstruction, and uh, you know, I was I was finishing high school. I was moving into into university. Um, judo provided a, a social circle of friends that were of my own age, uh, which wrestling didn't have. Um, in wrestling, I was the I was the youngest by 10 years, so I was a I was a child getting beaten by grown adults on it. Every time we trained, so uh, so being able to hook up with other with other young guys that were my age and that had a social circle attached to it, and yeah, those guys became my best friends and uh, as well as my training partners and my later my coaches. So uh, I, I think yeah, I think there's elements of, of the style of judo that that enamored me, but also just elements of the the social side of where I was at in my life and what the judo club provided. Interesting stuff. And you've hinted a couple times, you know, as as you you talk about the chronology of your your life growing up, you know, finding different martial arts, and you know, you said that you you're, you're kind of drawing a line in the sand roughly at at eighteen. We know that you, you know, continued training judo as you got into university, but you've kind of alluded to the fact that there's there's more, and I suspect that the more isn't just more judo. Am I right? Yeah, that's right. So, okay. uh, <laughs> so, so where where did where did judo take you next? Right. So, judo took me into competition. Uh, I I love competing. So I, I'm a if you if you can explain the rules to me in less than an hour, I'll have a crack at this. Better. So I <laughs> and even if you can't explain the rules, if the consequences of breaking them aren't that bad, I'll figure it out. <laughs> so, 
I um I became a I became very obsessed with with competing in judo and uh, and anything that was remotely similar. So uh, I was very fortunate that I that I was part of a very strong com- competitive club, and I and I progressed quite early. Um, within six months of coming back from my knee surgery, I uh, sorry six months of returning to the mat after my knee surgery, so probably eighteen months post op. Um, I was at, I won a, a an international open. Um, Within 12 months, I won a national title and then uh, made an Australian team uh, and competed internationally. I won a, a national university games. So I, I was able to, uh, I was able to, uh, to scratch that itch competitively with judo. Uh, unfortunately, um, as anyone in judo will tell you, that it comes with, it comes with the cost of injuries and, uh, and also no money. <laughs> so I, uh, I found it got to a stage in my life where, um, I had competed very hard for a number of years and uh, my body was hurting and I had no money and I decided to uh, take some time off over the, so here in Australia, we have a, uh, a summer break from, from university, similar to, uh, similar to the U S but uh, our summer break is, is over Christmas. And uh, over that time I decided I'd take some time off and I would uh, I'd go make some money and uh, a logical way to make money when you're, six foot three and 250 pounds and and uh on the national judo team is that you get a job as a bouncer in nightclubs and uh <laughs> i remember that i still just still remember that when i when i walked into the security company's office and said hey god this is me and this is my background and this is what i do and i was studying english literature at university so i wasn't uh i wasn't a meathead and uh, i said yeah, yeah i'd like to i'd like to make some money in nightclubs do you have anything and uh, you know their answer is pretty much can you start this weekend <laughs> so um yeah and I, I was again i was i was very green i was 19 years old um i i'd never been in a real fight in my life uh actually i take the back i'd had one real fight in my life and that was when i was um i think 10 years old or 11 years old and uh, i was swimming at a lagoon and uh, another kid i didn't know came up and punched me in the face because he thought i was somebody who said something about his sister and uh my response to that was to leave the lagoon and cry so that was my that was my only uh, my only exposure to real violence at that point, and here I was thinking that I'd be great as a bouncer. But um, I uh, yeah, so I, I started I started working in in nightclubs and pubs, uh, doing door work, and that really changed the game for me. Um, I started to realize that that real violence doesn't look like what I'd done in the dojo. Uh, that combat sport, uh, and by this point I, I dabbled. Um, I, I did a little bit of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I'd done a little bit of, uh, of striking arts, just mostly you know, playing around with friends who were also martial artists. Uh, and I realized that um, combat sport provides a good platform for the physicality of real violence, and as does traditional martial arts, depending on how it's trained. But there were so many other aspects that I wasn't prepared for. I wasn't prepared for um, threat of, of real harm. So, for example... Um, yeah, at the point that I started that I started bouncing, I was I was in pretty good shape. Uh, I could do you know, five five minute randori judo rounds with with top level judo guys, and I'd be okay. Um, you know, my cardio would, wouldn't be too bad. But uh, you know, a minute and a half rolling around on the floor of a nightclub with a big tongan, and, and I'd be gassed and <laughs> yeah, gasping gasping for air because the the threat of uh, losing entailed uh, physical harm. <laughs> he wasn't going. He wasn't going to stop when I got gassed, or he wasn't going to stop if I tapped out, or you know, there's a chance that I was going to get stomped on, or I was going to get glassed, or something. So um, there were so many different factors that that uh, I began to become aware of um, in terms of in terms of the risks of of real violence and the different different uh, facets, which we'll we'll get into for sure because that's the subject of my podcast. Mm. But uh, I, from a training point of view, I started doing more Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu because uh, all of a sudden I was working nights, and uh, most Judo training was at nighttime. So I, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't keep uh, training as regularly as I was. But there was a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu academy that had daytime classes, so I, I started doing more BJJ at that point, uh, just to. Uh, and it was also nicer to my body. And my, at that point, my shoulders were kind of beat up. Yeah, you know, my knee was kind of beat up, and it was nice to just sort of be on the ground and not being thrown around and taking that impact all the time. So, uh, so that, that was kind of where my training went for a little while. But uh, the big evolution for me was when I 
when I was really dealing with this real violence on a you know, three, four, five nights a week basis and figuring out you know, there, there is so much that martial arts hasn't prepared me for here and, I, and I'm figuring out some of it on my own, but there has to be something I can do that bridges the gap between what I'm training and, and what the reality is. And uh, at that point, I, uh, there, was a, there was a really good martial arts publication in Australia for many years called Blitz Martial Arts Magazine. And, and Blitz was something I subscribed to and I read every episode, I read, read every issue. And uh, they started running these, uh, these stories on this guy named Richard Dimitri from, from Canada. And he had a system called uh, Senshido. And Senshido was essentially uh, a reality-based self-defense method. Uh, where they, uh, Rich was, was quite well known for his applications of uh, scenario-based training and, uh, and making, making training as realistic as possible um, while considering safety, or yeah, sometimes not really considering safety, to be honest. But <laughs> he, said, he said he made it realistic. And uh, I, I started reading these articles and I thought, man, this guy, this guy's on to something. This, this looks a lot like what I'm dealing with. And uh, as it turns out, Rich was coming to Australia for his first seminar tour uh, that year and uh, I bought bought some plane tickets and I went out and I met the guy and we, we did four days of training and uh, it really opened my eyes to to reality-based self-defense and and how uh, really it was just a, it was a different delivery system for my existing skills so I, I came away from that that seminar with a couple of new tools but more importantly uh, more training how to apply the tools I already had uh, and that kind of started the evolution of me from uh, traditional martial artist and combat athlete to uh, what I would call a self-defense practitioner or a personal safety expert or yeah, whatever, whatever term you want to put in. I call myself a violence management practitioner now. <laughs> that's, a, that's what I do. I, ma I manage people's violence, whether they, you know, whether physically or psychologically or whatever. But uh, so yeah, that, that kind of was the next evolution for me was, um, was diving into how, how do we take people and prepare them to deal with real violence as opposed to stylizing it or, or making it an art. Mm. We, we've tackled this subject a few times on the show, and it's interesting that the, the, the subject of being a bouncer, you know, some kind of security mm. in a nightclub, really seems to be the kickoff for quite a few people as they start to understand the difference between the way violence is presented in a martial arts school and the way violence really is? I think it's just the exposure. Um, I mean, most, most martial artists, you know, to, to, be, you know, to be fair, I mean, most martial artists are fairly well-adjusted people. Uh, it, might, it might be a stretch, but I think most of us grow up with, uh, you know, the people that grow up studying martial arts on a, on, a, on a regular basis typically come from fairly stable environments. They typically... Uh, have some sort of positive influence in their lives, and they, therefore they're they're not likely to go out picking fights. Uh, they they don't usually grow up around violence because people who grow up around violence aren't usually concerned about finding a hobby. Uh, they they're concerned about surviving and <laughs> and, and and getting fed. So uh, because of that, I find a lot of martial artists don't have exposure to real violence unless they have an occupational exposure. So given that. Uh, I, I find that really the, the, the very few martial artists that really get it when it comes to real violence are those that have either worked in a, uh, some security roles uh, or they've, uh, they've worked in law enforcement or yeah, something similar that's, that's given them some exposure. But uh, I think generally you know, good people don't end up in violence on a regular basis. So uh, and if you're a good person and you're in violence on a regular basis, you need to consider your life circumstances and mm -hmm. what friends you keep, I guess. <laughs> but... Um, I think that's that's probably why. I mean, it's for most martial artists to get exposure to violence, it's got it's got to be a choice, um, yeah, unless you're just an ordinary human being and violence finds you. So we don't typically find those in martial artists. In martial arts, fortunately, yeah. 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 So yeah. let's let's try to educate the the li the listeners, and 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 I'm I'm including myself in that group. For those of us who have not spent time as a bouncer or in some sort of security role. How do you summarize the differences between, and I guess you can use yourself as an example, what did you find that struck you as, as odd or surprising as you started in this security role that made you say, wow, I, I had no idea? Yeah, I, I guess the, the hard thing is about that question is, is there's, there's a lot of things that when you think about it, it's common sense. Uh, but 
at the time, especially being, you know, I was, I was 19. I'd been training more or less for 15 years. Um, there's a lot of stuff that was instinctive that was a bad idea <laughs> that I could, I could objectively probably even then say that was a bad idea, but I did it anyway. because That's, that's just what my training uh, said to do. So for example, um, I, <laughs> baptism by fire, uh, I, my first shift, the, the first, first bouncing shift I ever did as a, remember, I've, I've never been in a real fight in my life really at this point. I, uh, I signed on at 7 PM. I was in my first fight at five minutes past seven. So it was a <laughs> welcome, welcome to the industry kid. Yeah. Uh, and I was on my own. Uh, they, they had, uh, they mucked up the roster and uh, I was doing my first shift solo for the first hour before the second guy arrived at 8 p.m. Uh, so I had to figure it out for myself. Uh, thankfully, I wasn't actively being attacked, but I was trying to break up a fight. There was a, there was a fight outside in the car park. One guy had the other guy bent over backwards over the, the, uh, the hood of the car and he was punching him in the face. And uh, I now know that he probably deserved it because <laughs> very rarely do you end up with a fight like that between two people without someone instigating it but um my instinctive reaction was to obviously pull the guy that was uh that was punching away and the guy that was being hit was bleeding and i put my body in between the two guys and literally kind of covered up the 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 guy well who i perceived to be the victim and i covered him with my body and was getting hit in the back of the head and I, I took about two or three shots before I realized that was a dumb idea because I've just sacrificed my safety for someone I don't know that I have no, no context as to whether he's the, the good guy or the bad guy. I, it was just the one who was losing the fight at the time that I became aware of it. Uh, and then I, yeah, I was able to, you know, other people came and helped and, and separated them. As I, was, as I was nursing the lumps on the back of my head, I thought, you know, I need to come up with a better strategy than that. It's a, it's a dumb idea. Uh, but I, was, I, I had a... I was kind of naturally a protector. My, my mindset was I, I protected people that were, that were weaker. And um, I'd always been that way, even as a kid. I was always someone who could step in and, and try and protect people. And uh, so that, that, was, that was one, one sort of evolution. Um, being aware of weapons uh, became another thing. I, I dealt with, the, I dealt with the guys with, with knives occasionally. Um, and there's always improvised weapons in that environment. So you know, you're always thinking about bottles and... Uh, uh, and glasses and, and things like that. Um, the, the multiple attacker situation, which you know, every martial art pays lip service to, if you have a multiple attacker, here's what you do. Um, but the reality of, of bouncing is that uh, very few people are in the nightclub on their own. Um, but also you have to consider, okay, they're in a group, but who's going to fight? Yeah, if this guy might be the loose cannon of the group and no one else has any appetite for violence whatsoever. And, yeah, you might have to deal with him, but his friends are going to stand back and go, well, that's just, that's just Tom being Tom. And they're, going to, they're happy to let him be dragged out. Or um, you might have a whole group that are all going to start fighting at the same time. Or you might, <laughs> you might have a group that are itching to fight the whole time. So uh, reading that group dynamic is important. Um, understanding the social hierarchy of, of the group you're talking to. So, for example, um, uh, you, you, if you're dealing with a family that are, that are getting rowdy and they need to be controlled, there's no point talking to the little brother. Uh, there's, there's always going to be someone who has control over the group and you need to talk to that person and try and build rapport there as opposed to um, you know, just taking the, the most problematic person and, and dealing with them first. So yeah, there's, a, there's an element of, of group psychology to be aware of. Um, uh, let me think, from a technical point of view, probably the, probably the thing that um, most martial artists don't really... Uh, wrap their head around for a little while is uh, is the law with use of force and uh, and appropriate levels of force and and so on, and uh, that is a really major stumbling block. Uh, and I, and I it still makes me shudder when I see some martial arts teaching self defense with no regard for what the law will say about what this technique is doing. So for me as a bouncer, I mean the, you can glorify the violence and you can say that uh, you know I was in real fights. Uh, three nights a week or whatever but um the reality is the vast majority of my quote unquote fights were removing intoxicated persons who refused to leave uh and uh, they weren't actively aggressive a lot of the time they were just passively aggressive they were just trying to resist or pull away or escape or yeah, you know, they might have been sort of flailing their arms but they weren't a real threat so my my inbuilt reaction to that flailing arm was to 
throw an oblique, click, uh, oblique kick and uh, collapse his knee uh, and then cripple the guy and he can't work for six months, then, well, that wasn't very good self-defense because I'm going to find myself in court. And, and unfortunately, I think a lot of martial artists who are, uh, who are operating in... Uh, yeah. So some people say, well, what's, what's, uh, what's the difference between reality-based martial arts and traditional martial arts? Well, if, they, if the traditional martial art is good, there's not a lot of difference, but it's the difference between reality-based martial arts and fantasy-based martial arts. Uh, I find a lot of martial artists are just, uh, uh, they're, they're laughing. <laughs> they're, 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 they're operating in a fantasy world that, um, that they hope one day they'll, they'll, they might have a chance to be Bruce Willis and Die Hard, but the reality is they, they don't really know what they're talking about. So I think that, yeah, that you understand the use of force, understanding the legal repercussions of violence and that you know, we live in a civilized society, most of us, um, and uh, you can't just go around practicing your martial arts techniques because you want to see what it looks like for real. Uh, you, have to, you have to understand the whys and the hows and, and be prepared to deal with the aftermath. Um, and probably also the, the last factor I'd, I'd throw in there as a big one is, is understanding that violence isn't over when you think it's over. Uh, you, like the, the fight isn't over when someone taps out. It isn't over when the person leaves. The, the fight is over once that person has decided it's over. So we had oftentimes we'd throw someone out of a club and you know, not even not even harm them in any way, just remove them and, and they'd come back three hours later still holding a grudge. And sometimes, thankfully not anywhere I worked, but it wasn't uncommon for someone to come back and try and stab the bouncers or uh, for guys to be have incidents in the car park. I, mean, I, I was followed home three hours after I removed these guys, and uh, they, they followed me home back to my back to my parents' house. Uh, and uh, thankfully, I was able to shake them before uh, before I got to their house. But uh, yeah, there's stuff like that that you just don't think about in your in your uh, your bunkai. <laughs> How are you going to handle that situation? Yeah, you know, I, I would I would imagine that like any other skill. You know the ability to perceive and, and and understand and work with violence gets better over time. Just like you know bunkai, like like practicing any technique, any other skill, martial arts wise or or not. Mm -hmm. But how do you start? Uh, uh, look, I, I wish I wish I had a really clear answer for that. Um, but I find that um, the best case scenario is your training reflects reality. So the, I think you need to build a base level of physical skills and i don't mean having a black belt uh, i think realistically if you've done martial arts three nights a week for one to two years uh, you've probably got enough skill to defend yourself uh, and depending on the quality of instruction you can shorten that learning curve dramatically but uh, i think for most people one to two years in a, in a style that has a little bit of contact and a little bit of pressure um you've got the you've got the physical skills um and then from there, it's uh, you hopefully add a level of scenario training so you learn to talk. Uh, that's, that's probably another downside that uh, uh, martial arts didn't prepare me for is that you know, nearly every conflict starts with communication and you need to know how to communicate and also how to read how that communication is going so that you, uh, you know when to pull the trigger to make things physical or when you don't have to pull that trigger. And uh, I find the larger caliber of <laughs> the larger the caliber you're packing, the, the longer you can wait before you pull the, pull the trigger. So um, I always encouraged uh, my, my fellow bouncers to train because it gave them more confidence that they could talk longer and understand that if it, if it went, if things went pear shaped, they'd still be okay because they trusted their training. So I actually found that um, the more physically adept someone is, the more patient they can be when they're, when they're dealing with someone who's, uh, who's aggressive and violent, uh, which was an interesting side effect. But um, I think, yeah, I think, I think you need a base level of skills, scenario replication, and then you've just got to do it. There really isn't, there's nothing that prepares you like doing it uh, and uh, I wish I wish I had the magic ingredient that bridges the gap between the, that training and, and reality but uh, the, the best you can hope for is that your bridge gets you, you know, 9% of the way there and it's just the last 10% you've got to figure out mm. whereas I found I came in my, my bridge got me about 30% of the way there <laughs> and, I, and I had to take a really big leap <laughs> to, to cover that, that last 70% uh, so my goal when I'm training people now is to, is to make that leap as, as short as I possibly can yeah yeah, and and the one thing I will speak to on this subject, the one sliver of understanding I have that's relevant here has to do with some of the drills that you can run within schools. And I, I've been very fortunate that some of my instructors have been very aware. And again, because just as as with you, 
because of personal experience outside of their martial arts training. They understood the difference between traditional martial arts and the application of what you've learned in a, a real violent scenario. And a lot of the drills that when, when I was younger, the higher ranks were taken through had almost nothing to do with technique and skill. They had to do with adrenaline. Yeah. You know, and, and I've been lucky enough because of whistle kick that I get the opportunity to travel around and train and, and, and oftentimes lead instruction. And one of the things that I will go back to time and again, if I'm not sure if, if nobody has anything else they want me to work on with them, if they're not quite sure what to do, that's usually what I'll pull out is some of these admittedly to me, very fundamental quote unquote reality esque, you know, and I, and I underscore esque very much drills and watching you know, third, fourth, fifth degree black belts that when confronted with a little bit of adrenaline and a free form situation, have no idea what to do. They can execute their forms and they can, they can spar at, at different, you know, under different rule sets incredibly well. But the moment it becomes even a tiny bit real, they break down. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to be honest to me, it's, it's not their fault. It's, it's something that's, um, that that's, they haven't been trained for. Exactly. Uh, and, I, and I think this is um, even just getting away from the, the idea of, um, of real violence for a second. I, mean, I, I think that sparring is critical. Uh, I mean, if you're not learning to apply your skills, you know, whether you want to call it sparring, kumite, randori, rolling, whatever, if you're not learning to apply your skills against someone who's actively resisting uh, and there's not some risk to yourself, whether it's being hit, whether it's being submitted, whether it's being whatever, then you are nowhere near reality. Because the the, the real, <laughs> real violence in, in, involves risk, and uh, and it involves timing and distance and application of pressure and, and power and, and all that stuff that you just can't get hitting a bag or or doing Carter up and down a hall. Uh, you you need to have a live opponent who's resisting you uh, if your goal is preparing for real violence. And this is something that I, I try to make a differentiation of because uh, so many people in the quote unquote reality based world, which I don't really like using that term anymore, but people know what I'm talking about usually when I say it. But uh, um, so many people in that world rubbish traditional martial arts and say they're useless or they don't have an application or whatever. And and I really I hate that because because I I love martial arts and I I, I consider myself a martial artist and always have done. Uh, and I think there's so much more that martial arts can provide that that have nothing to do with violence. Uh, and if if martial arts makes you a better person. And then, then that's actually really good violence prevention because if you, if your martial art, I don't mind if you do the most unpractical, non-contact, uh, completely fantasy level martial art. If it makes you a better person and you and you don't have an ego, or you have a, a very controlled ego because of that training, then that actually has prepared you to not get into fights because you're less likely to be punched in the face because you're a well-adjusted person. So I, I think there's a, there's an application there that has nothing to do with the physical skills of violence, but still makes you safer because you're you're a better human being. And uh, look, I think there's so much more that the martial arts provides than just learning how to fight. Uh, and it can be very easy to simplify things and go, well, if you're not if you're not getting punched in the head 15 times a week, then you're not learning real violence. And that's that's just rubbish. Um, and, and I think, and then there's combat sport as well. Like I've gone through stages in my life where I've trained purely for the spiritual development, the personal development. There's been times where I've trained purely for winning medals and trophies. There's been times where I've trained just for my own mental health, just to, to manage my stress. And there's been times where I've trained for survival and for, for making sure that I got to go home each night that I, that I finished work. And, uh, and not any one of those stages is more important than the others. So I've taken benefits from all different angles from martial arts, and I think that's uh, that's important. Um, but I don't I don't judge a, a black belt uh, who can't fight for real because if they haven't been prepared for it and it hasn't been something that's uh, you know, required of them, then well, why would why would they be any good at it? Right. Uh, right. And, and a person could probably teach me a lot, but not about that subject. Sure. And I appreciate you saying that and being so direct. In saying that, because one of one of the things that I've often said is that martial arts has, you know, different different tracks that you can go on, and not everyone's interested in learning how to be a, a you know, a tough guy. You know, not everyone is truly interested in learning 
how to, you know, mix it up, how to how to get in a fight. Well, that's right, and and I mean, I don't. <laughs> and think, that's okay. Um, yeah, yeah, and the reality is that most of us don't need to be doomsday preppers. <laughs> like we, like we, most most martial artists I've met in my life have a steady nine to five job, and they have a, a wife and a or, or husband and kids. They um. Yeah, they, they they go out for dinner on a Saturday night and they have good friends and they volunteer at church on Sundays and, and, and that's that's their life. Is that does that person really, really, really need to obsess themselves three nights a week or five nights a week with with fighting in a gutter and worrying about hypodermic needles? Probably not. I mean that's that's probably not their, their reality. So um and that's that's a, that's my other big gripe about reality based self defense is that's uh a lot of the instructors that their reality is so obscene that I'm like, whose reality are we dealing with here? <laughs> I mean, is, is yeah, Bob from the from the uh, the church host team is is he going to be really rolling around in gutters, or is is his reality making sure that he gets some cardio in so he doesn't die of a heart attack in his sixties? That's that's reality based self defense for Bob because that's that's the real threat, <laughs> not right. not being attacked by a group of ninjas that are going to repel out of a helicopter. Um, right. Well, so, I, I, I think the moment, yeah. you know, we all started to accept, you know, as martial artists, we accepted that there was validity in reality based systems. Mm. That there were some who kind of took it to the extreme. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. oh, well, you know, your your system is, is great for for one on one. But what about when it's three on one? Uh, OK, so now we've got this. OK, so what about when it's three on one? And there are weapons. What about when it's mm-hmm. three on one and you're on an airplane or it's one on one and somehow you're in an airplane bathroom with this other person and one of your feet is wedged into the toilet because statistically <laughs> that I suppose could happen. Probably not, but it could. So now we need to make sure that our system is able to answer that possibility. Yeah. Well, you know what? Yeah. Someone comes up and knifes you in the back. No system defends against that. No system defends yeah. against random, blind violence with no opportunity to respond. And unfortunately, it does happen once in a while. So you, you, you have to see, I, I see that. And that gives me a, a sense of, of freedom because I have to accept that there are some things I can't defend against. Yeah, absolutely. I, I had a student ask me once, what, what would you do if you got hit in the head with a baseball bat? I'd probably so die. I'd probably I said I'd probably bleed. It's <laughs> kind, of, kind of. I mean, I've already been hit, right? So there's not a lot left to do. Um, but look, my yeah, I, I 100% agree with what you're saying. And and one of my cliches, I'm always yelling at training is is train for probability, not possibility. And tra- training for the possibilities sometimes it's fun just to just to if you if you take it for the ridiculousness of what it is. You can kind of stack the odds. Like if I've got a, a a good level martial artist who's who's kind of, you know, their their basic drills and their basic skills are quite good, um, then yeah, we can we can play with some fun stuff and go. Okay, well, you've got an arm in a sling, and uh, you've got a seven year old child with you, and you're confronted by three people. What are you going to do? Uh, and and that is a is a different level of stress and problem solving that uh, is fun to play with, but it shouldn't be your regular training because it's 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 a very stressful situation um and, and i do like to i do like to throw in variables so with with the training uh, we didn't we didn't really get there in the in the development but uh, i do uh, i do teach reality based martial arts and and uh yeah, i'm a krav maga instructor as well but um and i was an instructor under rich dimitri eventually uh, with senshido as well so i teach a reality based system but um i do like to throw in variables so I find that sometimes we oversimplify violence and sometimes we overcomplicate violence. Uh, I think to get someone ready for violence doesn't take that long. I think anyone who's willing to train hard can get there in six six months, two years if they're, if they're not training that regularly, uh, where they have enough prerequisite skills and knowledge to be safe for most people. I mean, if someone's a, if someone's a law enforcement officer making daily arrests, then they're probably gonna need a little bit more training. If someone's a bouncer, they're gonna need a little bit more training because their exposure is greater. But I think we can overcomplicate things by adding in so many variables that we forget that the skill set's actually fairly basic. Um, but at the same time, we can oversimplify things by, for example, this is a, a pet peeve of mine, um, women's self-defense classes, where you've got someone who 
he's going to be exposed to yeah maybe five techniques over the period a period of two hours and they're going to do about 10 reps on each technique and then they're going to walk away feeling safer which i think is, is rubbish um and, and some of the some of the cliches of well you don't need to win the fight you just need to run away running away is great until you've got a mum with two kids in a pram uh, is she going to run from the fight and leave the kids behind is, is that what we're training her to do or is she going to have to stay with those kids and, and, and be able to either make an escape with the pram or finish the fight or get help without leaving those children? Uh, or if you're you know, saying, oh, well, you just need to run away is great until the person you're training is a, is a 70 year old person with, with decreased mobility and who, who legitimately won't be able to run away. Uh, or you're, you're trapped or you, there's, there is nowhere to run because you're in a, you know, you're in a confined space. You, you you're, fighting for your life in an underground car park or in an elevator or so there, there are there are so many variables that I like to throw in just to change up the end state because yeah it is great to just be able to stun and run and uh, that's a good skill to have but you need to have something else if that's not appropriate for that situation um, like for example if I'm training a bouncer he can't run away like he, his job is <laughs> his job is to stay there right uh, and I've had guys that have run away during their shift and they don't get another shift so <laughs> that's, that's your career done. Like if you, if you leave, uh, unless, unless it was a really, really serious situation and you're literally saving your own life. Okay. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. If you run from the fight because it got a little bit dangerous, then you're probably in the wrong line of work. So yeah, yeah there are different, different levels and different skills. And, uh, I think we, yeah, we are, we're equally guilty of, of overcomplicating as well as oversimplifying. Uh, and I think it's a matter of, there's no syllabus. It's, what does this person need? What's their exposure occupationally and, and personally and domestically? What's, what's going to be the appropriate skill set for them to learn to keep themselves safe? And how do I get them to that end point as quickly and efficiently as possible? Is this the type of stuff you talk about on your show? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I actually talk, I talk about a variety of different t- subjects about surviving violence. Um, it's not always martial arts. Uh, obviously, this is a martial arts conversation. But uh, right. uh well, take a few minutes and tell the audience, you know, I, I, I think everyone knows I have, I have no problem encouraging folks to listen to other shows. I, I hope they continue listening to this one. But you know what? If somebody finds a show that better resonates for them and they don't have time, I, I prefer people, you know, get well, the, the knowledge and the, the entertainment from the shows that they want. So take a few minutes and tell people about your show. Sure. Okay. So, so my show is called the Managing Violence Podcast. So if you just search for Managing Violence Podcast, it'll, it'll come up in pretty much every podcast platform that's out there. Um, and the, the idea of the Managing Violence Podcast was, was taking what I do professionally. So my, my professional, my, my day job is uh, I'm aggression. And I, sorry, let me start again. My day job is I'm an aggression management specialist. So I, I work with organizations that have customer aggression or client aggression and uh and work with them on the strategies to to manage that aggression so i was taking a lot of what i teach uh my clients and uh and putting it into a uh, a podcast or a, 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 a an educational tool that anyone can access and uh my goal with that podcast is is not just to provide the knowledge that i have but to interview people that are experts in, in areas that i'm not an expert in or that have a different viewpoint or yeah, sometimes it's just a vehicle for me to talk to someone that I've looked up to for a number of years, and it's great to have a conversation as peers. But um, I, I look at violence from all different angles. So we can be too easy. It's too easy to fixate on the physical of violence, and worry, you, there's only so much time you can spend worrying about how to defend against a, a right looping overhand uh, punch. When what we should be talking about is situational awareness and understanding risk profile and understanding uh, what kinds of people get into fights and what kind of people um, will pick fights and understanding how predators think and, uh, and, and uh, predatory groups versus predatory individuals and target selection and victim identification, and all these sorts of subjects that are so important because if you understand all of that, then you don't have to worry about being punched because you weren't there in the first place uh, or you weren't an attractive target in the first place. So we talk about those sorts of situations. Uh, we talk about, the, the truth of surviving violence and what the most important um, most important attributes are. And uh, as, a, as a spoiler alert, the least important thing is your knowledge of technique. Um, the most important things are your, your mindset, your physical fitness, and your uh, I, I, yeah, 
ideally an, ex uh, an exposure or an experience with violence. Uh, we talk about um, criminal psychology. We talk about sociology. Uh, I've, uh, I've had experts from healthcare, from mental health, uh, mental health practitioners on the show, talking about um, the risk that they, that they deal with on a regular basis, dealing with patients who, uh, through no fault of their own, uh, are quite, they can be quite violent. That, um, you know, that due, due to an illness, they're they're unpredictable or explosive, or they're dealing with psychosis or whatever. Um, I've had experts from, so I've had uh, Matt Larson, who's a lifelong martial artist and director of combatives at West Point Academy on the show. And that was a fascinating conversation about not just training, but also uh, just about the psychology of, of combat and uh, his work in that field. Uh, we've had uh, experts from uh, from the training world. I've had a couple of overlapping guests from the, from this show as well. I've had uh, Gershon Ben-Karen. Uh, he was he was one of my early guests. I've had Rory Miller uh, as well, who's been on this show. Uh, and uh, I, I'm really interested in talking about the preventative side of violence as opposed to the physical. Uh, the physical, I think, it's very hard to learn physical self-defense in, in an audio platform, but you can certainly learn a lot about psychology and prevention of violence uh, through that platform. So that, that's my focus with the Managing Violence podcast, is, uh, is equipping regular people and martial artists alike to be safer uh, without making them too paranoid, hopefully. Mm. Great. And of course, folks, we're going to link to everything that's relevant to this conversation and, and help you find Coach Saunders' show. Uh, you know, our, our links are at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, of course. This, is, this has been good stuff. So we've spent time talking about the now. We've spent time talking about the past. Let's talk about the future. You sure. know, when you consider your, your career and everything that you've got going on and your training, what are you looking forward to? Well, I'm looking forward to uh, one of your listeners deciding to fund my operation and uh, and allowing me to, uh, to to record podcasts full time. <laughs> well, get in line because they haven't done that for me yet. <laughs> <laughs> I got dibs. <laughs> uh, actually, it's, it's interesting. I'm I'm in a I'm in a kind of a fun stage in my journey at the moment where uh, uh, I've mentioned a couple of times. I think preparing yourself for violence doesn't take that long. Uh, and to to be completely honest and and to be a be transparent about um, my own training at the moment. I mean, I, I'm a big guy. I I don't present as an easy target, and I've done a lot of training over the years. So, and I feel like I have a pretty good handle on uh, all the preventative stuff when it comes to, when it comes to violence. So I don't really train for for self defense that much anymore. I, I train to keep my skills sharp. The physical you know, the perishable skills are I, I train those to keep them sharp. But uh, in terms of my motivation, I, I'm fairly confident that I'm that I'm okay. Uh, when it comes to if, if violence were to visit me or my family, I feel like I'd probably I'd probably manage it okay. Um, so that's not my motivation for training anymore. Um, and uh, I I did find myself uh, adrift a little bit in terms of my own training. Not not just you know teaching is one thing. So teaching it depends on uh, you know, what, what the students need. But um, for my own training, I found myself a little bit adrift and wasn't sure uh, where I wanted to progress next. And uh, Quite funny because the the end of last year, uh, my I've got four kids. I've got four daughters. So yeah, you talk talk about having a need for self defence. I've got <laughs> I've got I've got four daughters under seven. So uh, uh, the uh, the teenage years are going to be fun. But um, my oldest two um, started you know, getting to an age where they wanted to do some uh, yeah, some sort of sport. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to do was obviously enrol them in judo and hope hope they enjoyed it. And I took them to a friend's dojo and. I hadn't been on a judo mat in five years at that point. And uh, just through work and you know, life, uh, I'd sort of stopped training judo and was focusing more on teaching and, and what I was doing professionally. And uh, so, I, so I took the kids into the judo class. And, uh, thankfully, they enjoyed it. I was going along each week. And I was watching the class and the, the, the dojo had a boxing class that was on at the same time as the kids' judo class. So I started joining in the boxing class just to, yeah, just to sharpen some skills and keep my fitness up. And, and also to stop them running off the mat to talk to me every five minutes. <laughs> if, I, if I was sitting at the side, they're going to keep running off. So I just tried try to keep busy so that they wouldn't come find me. But um, after a little while, I was like, you know, I should get the gear back on. I should, I should go help out. Uh, I was watching sometimes that yeah, they'd have two adult instructors and 40 kids running around and it was chaos. And I thought, you know, I, I should be helping. I'm already here. I may, I may as well get on the mat and help with the kids. So uh, that progressed. And then I was like, well, yeah, there's an adult class that comes straight after. I, 
oh, maybe I should get on and, and you know, have a little bit of a roll and, and you know, have some fun. And so I, I got on the mat and I thought, yeah, this doesn't feel as bad. Like, I'm not as rusty as I thought I was. You know, it kind of feels like home. And, uh, you know, obviously things were a little bit laggy. <laughs> Sometimes when you haven't trained for a long time, you, your brain knows that you know something from there, but by the time you think of it, <laughs> yes. the moment has passed. Yes. And uh, so I battled that quite a bit. <laughs> Whereas I, I was like, I know what to do. I know what to do from here, but I can't think of what to do. Oh, I know what it was. Oh, it's gone. So uh, that was, that was my, my existence for a little bit. And then uh, I, um, I thought, you know what? I'm feeling pretty good. And I'd really like the kids to get into competition because I, I think, uh, especially for my oldest daughter, I thought competition would be good for her because uh, I think there's a lot of lessons that you can only learn from, from sport and from competition and I thought she'd benefit from it. But she was very uh, very risk adverse. She, did, she wasn't interested in, in competing. And uh, I thought, you know what, maybe if she sees me compete, because yeah, I'd done all my competition before my kids were born. But maybe if she sees me compete, that um, it might, yeah, lower that barrier to her. So I started talking to my coach uh, about uh, about competing again and doing some local competitions, just low level stuff. And, and we, we decided on a game plan. So yeah, that's cool. We can do that. And then I, I started talking to him about. So who who are the who are the top heavyweights in the area? Like who, who are the top guys in my division that I should be aware of? And he gave me a couple of names and said these are the guys that are currently on the the national team at your at uh, in your division and. And I said, well, how good are they? And he said, well, you know, because my coach has actually known me from my, my previous competitive career as well. So uh, he said, look, if you, uh, if you got back to where you were and you put in a good six months of training, you, you'd be competitive. And you can't really say that to, to someone who's a natural competitor without sort of stoking the fire a little bit. So I was like, well, hang on a minute. In a period of three months, I went from, I'm going to take my kids to the dojo to... Um, Maybe 2020 Olympics is not out of reach. <laughs> so, <laughs> nice. So I'm I'm uh, I'm 33 years old and making a making a comeback this year uh, in in competitive judo. Because, and it's it's funny, like even though I, I kind of moved past combat sports for a number of years, the back training twice a day, doing my strength and conditioning in the mornings, and, and training judo classes and Brazilian jiu jitsu classes in the evenings. And preparing for competitions and mapping out mapping out game plans and peaking and tapering periods and all that sort of stuff. It's it's really lit a fire under me to uh, my training is better than it's been in years because uh, I've got something that's sort of making me passionate and excited uh, for my own training, not just for my teaching. So, yeah, so yeah, my, my uh, at the moment my um, my uh, my current situation is I, I'm training I'm training judo and Brazilian jiu jitsu four or five nights a week and, I, and I'm teaching my, my Krav Maga classes three nights a week and uh, I'll persist with that. I, I've sort of promised my wife that this is a, an early midlife crisis and that um, I'll try to get another good two years out of competition uh, while my body holds up and then I'll, I'll find something else. Maybe start doing old man judo instead where I just throw people and don't get thrown myself. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be the guy sitting on the side with the big belly and the, and the black belt that... Uh, that doesn't actively get involved in much because I'm too broken. But uh, yeah, so that, that's that's my immediate future is uh, I'm sort of making a, a a bit of a dad's army comeback to uh, to competition, and uh, I'm hoping to keep growing the podcast. And um, so, sorry, I, I almost forgot to plug the the thing that uh, was probably most important to plug. Uh, on the eighth of April, I'm launching a website uh, called DefendYourself.tv. And uh, defendyourself.tv is essentially, I'm hoping to grow it into an online uh, encyclopedia of everything self-defense. So uh, I want to have, obviously, my podcast, but also uh, video tutorials ranging from short three-minute clips on how to defend against this particular type of attack, uh, or right through to hour-long lectures on psychology and sociology and uh, whatever other subjects I can think of. Uh, we'll have academic journal articles, we'll have blog articles, we'll have video interviews. Uh, basically, anything I can think of that will be relevant for learning how to protect yourself against violence, uh, that will go on defendyourself.tv. Uh, and I'm also happy to have an instructor uh, portal as well where we can, uh, we can share drills. Uh, I'm very big on creative drills. Uh, I, like to, I like to make training interesting and I've got a lot of ideas on, on how we can drill that replicate reality in a safe and engaging hopefully entertaining way uh, because we're 
we any instructor knows that the uh, the commercial pressures of, of teaching martial arts demand that uh, you can't just be educational. You also have to be provide some level of entertainment, or else people won't spend their money to keep coming back and seeing you. <laughs> so you've got to you've got to make training interesting, and uh, I I try to do that as well. So my my goal is to be able to provide a, an online resource that any, anyone who's interested in either defending themselves against violence or teaching others to do it uh, can can access that website and can uh, can derive some benefit from it. Sounds like a wonderful resource. And if if I'm reading the calendar right, this is going to come out just before. So if you're listening to this episode, that website should be up. Perfect. So now, now, now there's a little bit of pressure. We've just told everyone that that's up. So it's got to be ready. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, now, now I have to stick to the deadline. That was, that's that's right. part of my uh, that's part of my motivation for for giving you a date, <laughs> rather than just Good. saying at some point in the future we'll launch defend yourself. No, defendyourself.tv will be live on the eighth of April or earlier. If it's not, feel free to send complaints to Jeremy. Oh, absolutely, and I will forward them on to you. <laughs> I will build a filter in my email so I don't even see <laughs> them. And they go, they go right to you. I might append some kind of uh, image uh, uh, that 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 makes it clear that you are responsible. I don't know. Well, we we could have some fun with that. But yeah, I, I've launched a number of websites, and I know it, the moment you you put a deadline on it and you tell people about it. And honestly, that's for any goal, right? I mean, that that's the mm -hmm. expert advice on goal setting is tell everyone you know that you're going to do X by such and such date. And to hold you accountable, and then all of a sudden, oh shoot, I have to do this now. Yeah, yeah, and the the, the hard thing for me is um, uh, well, well, I won't say the hard thing. The uh, the limitation for me, other than time, is just uh, getting all the content that I've generated over the years and, and kind of rebranding it. And uh, you know, some some videos I want to reshoot because uh, you know I shot them in two thousand eight on you know, a potato, and <laughs> it's a uh, yeah. Yeah, you look, look at the video quality now and go, well, the content was good, but uh, I think I might need to reshoot that because it's not really going to fly in 2019. <laughs> that level of uh, that level of video quality, but um, yeah, so it's, it's just a matter of going through and uh, and trying to get all that content in one place, system branding, so that uh, people know what they're looking at. And, uh, uh, I, I would encourage anybody um, who wants to reach out and uh, and suggest a topic. Uh, I'm Look, I will talk martial arts all day long, uh, and uh, I'm, I can talk about violence prevention all day long too. So, if you've got suggestions of anything you would like to see or anything you're you're curious about, um, you can you can email me at joe j o e at defendyourself.tv, and uh, I'm more than happy to take suggestions of, of for content. Um, yeah, if you ask me a, a specific personal question, I'm happy to respond to that too. But I'd, I'd rather respond in a uh, in the website so that uh, other people can benefit from it as long as it's not. Uh, in particular perfect <laughs> so but yeah absolutely anyone anyone who wants to contribute uh I'll, that's a, that's another thing too i'm hoping to eventually grow a database of contributors as well so it's not just me writing and producing i'd rather i'd rather have a whole team of people that uh want to contribute to the greater good and and uh, put good material out there so again joe at defendyourself.tv perfect well this has been a lot of fun i i i've enjoyed our conversation and i certainly learned some stuff i hope everyone listening did as well and you've listened to the show, so you know how we kind of send this out. What parting words Absolutely. would you offer up to the people listening today? Parting words. I think probably the most important thing that I've learned, uh, especially over the last 10 years of my training, is that your training needs to add to your quality of life, not detract from it. And what I mean by that is that uh, in the reality-based self-defense world or you know, even taking that reality based, if you train exclusively for self defense, consider why you're doing that and consider whether that training is actually improving your quality of life or detracting from it. Because if you are training from a place of negativity where you're training because you're paranoid or because you're scared, then engaging in that training on a regular basis is only accessing those negative emotions in more powerful ways repeatedly. And I think that can be de more detrimental to your safety than not training at all. So you need to make sure that what you are training has a positive uh, outcome and it's a positive emotion for you. So if you're not enjoying your training, if it's not something you look forward to doing, but you're doing it because you feel you have to or else you're going to be victimized, then something's wrong and, and you need to look at what you're doing. So whatever it is, and I, like as we've discussed, I've been through so many different stages of training for different purposes and different arts and, and, uh, and different outcomes, but it has to serve you. It, it can't detract from your quality of life so I, I think i just urge everybody to keep that 
uh, at, at the forefront. If you're not enjoying your training, do something different. Uh, but if you want to learn how to protect yourself, it doesn't take that long. You don't, you don't, you don't have to train for 10 years and, and get a black belt before you, if you have to have a black belt before you can learn to fight, then, uh, you, your instructor's not very good. Sorry. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, that'd be my, that'd be my takeaway is, is enjoy your training, do what makes you happy. Uh, because longevity, uh, in the martial arts is, uh, is, is one of the secrets. Uh, if you, if you can persist and keep, keep enjoying it and keep doing it for a number of years, it, it'll, it'll keep giving back to you. But uh, if you don't enjoy it, then you won't get any of those benefits. I love when I have other podcasters on the show. It just makes my job so much easier. We get to have a better conversation. We can kind of dig out in the weeds a little bit. And more so, my favorite part about it is I don't have to work that hard. Coach Saunders was great at just taking the conversation, running with it, and really presenting some awesome information. I hope you all check out his show as I already have done. If you want to find the show notes with links to that show and everything else he's got going on, head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Check that out there. Don't forget, Podcast 15 gets you 15% off everything at whistlekick.com. We'd appreciate any help you can give us, be that a share or a review, a purchase, even a comment, even feedback, anything that you do that lets us know you're listening and you appreciate what we're doing is appreciated right back in return. Find us on social media. We are at Whistlekick on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. You can email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. And I love seeing those emails come through. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 